Grab your Bibles and go with me to the book of Titus. Book of Titus. So we as a church, to our guests, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Glad you're a part of our worship service this morning. We as a church, in, in, in our preaching, the way we do preaching here as a church, we do what's called expository preaching. We take a book of the Bible and we run through that book verse by verse until we're done. Typically, we are not a topical preaching church. We go through books of the Bible. And I do that because a lot of times as you do that, you're going to cover topics. You're going to cover things that might you might not necessarily jump into on a topical way. So today we're going to continue our study. And I find it fascinating and timely and providential that as we're in this resurrection Easter service, that this text is lining up with what is needing or what is needed and what is relevant in our day. I just I don't believe that that is a, a mess by or a you know happenstance. I think God is sovereignly in control, and so we're going to look at Titus chapter two today we're continuing our, our look through Titus and last week we saw in our study of the book of Titus that the one who is to be leading the church we talked about what it looks like uh, and who is to lead the church who is to to help guide and direct the church and the office of elder and and the idea of what that looks like and men who are godly self-controlled above reproach men, those are the people that are to guide and lead the church. And so they, these men were engulfed by self-control. They wanted to see things happen in God's time the way God laid it out. That's how we started. And then we end the text at the end of this talking about false preachers and false teachers who try to infiltrate the church and they teach Things that are self-centered, self-promotion, a, a gospel that is narcissistic to the core. And it's all about making them money and making them famous. That was the idea of the text. And so Paul is telling Titus and warning him against these kinds of guys. In fact, at the end of chapter 1, verse 16, Paul professes this and says, These types of false preachers, they profess to know God. But they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, unfit for every good work. So he gives the church a warning here. He tells the pastor Titus, he gives him a warning. He says, Pastor Titus, this is a problem. I'm warning you against these people, what they look like. Avoid them, expose them, and get rid of them. And so today, as we kick off chapter 2, we see... From the moment the pen hits the paper, Paul is showing Titus and the church what they should be doing and what they should be involved with and what they should be committed to. And I firmly believe that on this Easter Sunday, this is the same thing that you and I as a church need to be committed to as well. So Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you... He's talking to Titus, he's talking to the church, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. This is the word of the Lord this morning. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time to open up your word. And God, I ask that as we study this verse, as we go through this, that we would be mindful of what you've laid out for us that we would follow your word, that we would not follow the whims of men, follow the whims of a, de a denomination, but we would follow the commands of your word. Give us strength. We love you in Christ's name. Amen. So, so Paul writes to Titus here and he says, okay, here's what the false preachers did, but here's what you're to do. Don't fall for the trap of a self-centered, narcissistic, false gospel. Rather, you teach what accords with sound doctrine. Now, when you read the word sound, it is Greek for the word healthy. So if you want to take your pen and just put in the margin and maybe draw a line the word and circle the word 
sound, and then right up beside it, healthy. Just write the word healthy there. Paul uses this word sound or healthy nine separate times in the pastoral epistles. Now, so what is the pastoral epistles for our guests? That's First and Second Timothy and the book of Titus. We just finished First and Second Timothy. That took us almost a year. Um, I don't think Titus is going to go that long, but we're only doing one verse today, so we'll see how that goes. Um, gotcha. So the, it's used nine separate times in those three books. So the idea of making sure the church understood what it looked like to, to partake in healthy gospel-centered teaching was absolutely important. And so when I look at you all this morning and say, listen, I believe that the church as a whole, not saying this church or maybe a couple of places, I'm saying the church as a whole is a theological mess. We got some, we got some crazy churches out there. Amen. We got some churches that are just a mess. And, and many don't want to think of it. Many in, in the pew, many do not want to think about their church being a theological mess. They just want to come in and do what they're supposed to do. But that's, I find it fascinating. There's a lot of folks who come in on Easter and Christmas and they, they do their, their check-in. So you guys are here for your check-in. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to boldly and lovingly try to help you understand that that is not what we're supposed to do. We need to be activated in the body of Christ, not just affiliated because being affiliated ain't going to get you into the pearly gates. Yeah. Just, just so you know that. Just so you, I checked in on Easter. That means I'm going to heaven. No, it doesn't. I love you enough to tell you that. So many people don't want to think about it. They just say, pastor, just preach the gospel. That's all we want you to do. Just preach the gospel, pastor. Well, do you understand what you're asking for? Do you understand the, the weighty complications of give me the gospel? I, I understand and get that your gener that this generation, that this group, that this world is looking for answers. You're looking, you've come here this morning. Maybe you're just, this is just tradition for you to show up on Easter Sunday. But down deep, you're looking for answers. And I'm not going to have the opportunity to have a room full of people and not give you the truth. I'm not going to tickle your ears and placate to your desires and what you want. I, I said this this morning, pastors, that the appeal is real. But feed the sheep, don't entertain the goats. So I'm, I'm not going to entertain goats this morning. I'm going to feed the sheep. And if you want to repent of your sins and become a sheep, you can. You can. I, I understand and get that you're looking for answers, so I'm trying to help. Things are pressing in on us from all sides. The world, uh, For me to say the world is a mess, nobody in here is going, oh, that's a, just a bold statement to make, Pastor. Like that's, I know that it's not a bold statement. You know that it's a mess. Things are pressing in us, on us from all sides. And what can happen to people that aren't dug in and buried into the word of God is you can start to go look for other answers and other ideologies and other faiths and other systems that are not going to offer lasting hope, but you're looking for an answer. You're looking for an answer and you try to go find it in a relevant place. And this morning, what I want to try to do is help us understand that a majority of the ideologies in the world today are false and they're 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 dragging people into the pits of hell and they don't even realize this like what is satan called he's the father of what lies deception he's the father of that so that means he's really good at it and he's good at deceiving people into believing things are true when they're really not he's good at making you believe you're actually a christian when you're actually not so i want to try to help us because here's where the first I want to give you the first thing that people tend to do. So we looked at, he says, Paul tells Titus, teach what is healthy doctrine. So I'm going to teach you some, I'm going to show you some unhealthy doctrine, and then I'm going to show you why um, you should not believe those things. So in the world in which we live today, it is a hugely popular thing to say this, follow your heart or 
believe in yourself or be true to yourself, especially with little girls. I don't know what it is. You go into the, like a clothing section at a Target or Walmart or whatever, and you have these girl shirts that have just a little rainbow across the, the front of it. It says, follow your heart. Like that is a dumb idea. Here's why. You lie to you more than anybody else. Jeremiah, is, and the Bible is backed up with it. Like it backs this up. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Like that verse takes that saying of follow your heart and chops it off at its kneecaps and it falls flat, flat on its face. It is a dangerous ideology to follow your heart. If you follow your heart, it, that will end you up in hell. Period. Period. We are not called to follow our hearts. We're called to follow Jesus. That's what we're called to do. That's one ideology that's horrific. One doctrine that is horrific is following your heart. Mix that. Write that down. Put that down in the, in the, in the in your note section on your bulletin. Don't follow my heart. Follow Jesus. And what does that look like? We're going to get there in a minute. Another doctrine that is pushing. So Caleb, well, how about this one? I just need to hustle and work and grind and make money. Now, I am not against working. I think, in fact, the scripture says that if you don't work, you don't eat. That's right. So I'm I am very much pro-work. But here's what we do in the world in which we live. We find our identity and our jobs, and we hustle and grind to the point where it becomes an idol. Right? We work in such a way that it becomes the, the end-all, be-all. I don't know if you know this. I'm going to lovingly tell you this. Your house one day is going to be lived in by somebody else. Your stuff, your truck, your, your trinkets, your gadgets are going to be owned by somebody else or they're going to be in a landfill somewhere one day. It's coming. It's coming for you. So the idea of hustle and grind, Matthew chapter 16, this is Jesus stating this. He says, and what... Does it benefit you if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? There's so many of us that are trying to gain the world, but I'm telling you, that won't work. He's, like, I watched the, this little mini documentary on Toby Keith. Like, Toby had it all, but he still died. You might have it all right now, but you're going to die. What's your eternity look like? Jesus says, what does it benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? And I would follow up and say, no, nothing is worth more than your soul. Nothing is worth more than your soul. You see, right now, this very moment, there is a battle that is happening in this room, a war for your heart, a war for your affections, a war for your mind. And so what I want to do in the few moments that we have together is I want to try to help you very clearly understand the answers for the world in which we live and provide you with, with the reality of what God's laid out in his word for us. Sound, healthy doctrine so that you can move out of the position of sickness spiritually and be healed completely in your souls. So... The first thing you need to understand is the issue at hand. And we, we need to see that the issue is a three-letter issue. Three small little letters. S-I-N. Sin is the issue. In fact, Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, and he says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All, I'm just going to let you all in on a little secret. You guys, focus in real quick. A little secret. All means everybody, including the guy up here. All of us have fallen short. All of us have sinned. Now, you say, Caleb, wait a second. I'm a pretty good guy. I pay my taxes. I'm good to my wife. I got cows. I live in Kansas for, for Pete's sake. Right? I'm doing good. I'm a great guy. Let's test that because a sin is breaking God's law. Let's look at just a few of them. And like, I like crowd participation, so let's play this out together. Let's do it. How many of you guys have ever told a lie? If you're not raising your hand, you're a liar. <laughs> just wanted to help you. How many of you guys have ever stolen anything? Now, you told me you're a bunch of liars, so I don't believe you if you don't, you know, <laughs> saying. 
For the boys and girls that are in the room, how about this one? How many guys have always honored your mother and father? Darren just put his hand up. I think that's a little. Pam, is he lying? Okay, yeah, just checking. All right, all right. We're, on, we're on the right path. So by our own admissions, every one of us in the room have, are liars and thieves. And we disobey our parents. We don't honor them. How many of you guys have ever used God's name as a four-letter cuss word? Even the guy up here has. Uh-oh. So we're all blasphemers at heart. That's just four. You say, wait a minute, Caleb, I got this. I never killed anybody. That's fantastic. Love you. Love you for that thought. But Jesus internalizes it in the New Testament. He says, if you have rage against your brother, if you hate your brother, you're guilty of murder. Uh-oh. Well, wait a minute, Caleb. I've always been faithful to my spouse. I've never cheated. I've never done anything bad. Let's talk. Let's hold on. Scripture says, if you ever looked at someone, this was Jesus, not Caleb. Jesus said, if you ever look at someone with lustful intent, you've committed adultery with them already in your heart. Uh-oh. So now we've got a room full of really bad folks, according to God's standard. Because that's how we have to answer the question. Is whose standard are you good by? By, um, are you good by my standard, your standard, your neighbor's standard? We have to line up with God's standard. What does God's standard say about you? He says you're sinful. That's it. And in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Like that's what you earn. You and I have earned. If you want to say, well, I'm going to just get to heaven and just hope God loves me enough on the, on when I get there, that my good works have outweighed my bad. I'm going to promise you your bad has outweighed your good. And the Bible says that even your good works are filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. So you are not getting in on the basis of your works. You will be sent for all eternity to hell if you're basing it off your works. Scripture says the wages of sin, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Ephesians chapter 2 says that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And the pro so the problem in the world, listen, because here's what we can tend to do. We can tend to try to shift the blame off of us. And we can try to say it's somebody else's fault. It's my mom's fault. It's my dad's fault. It's my teacher's fault. It's my uncle's fault. It's, it's the government's fault. Ah, uh, it's the that's that's what we'll do. We'll blame the government. It's the Republicans. It's the Democrats. It's we'll do that, right? Stop. The problem in the world is not a political problem. The problem in the world is not your family. The problem is sin, and more particularly, your sin, my sin, is the problem. Ephesians chapter two, verse three says that we are all. By nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But listen, you said, Caleb, wait a second, Pastor. This is seeming a little doom and gloom. You got to hear the bad news before the, we get to the good news. That's just part of the, the package yeah. deal. You got to hear the bad news first. The bad news is that you're sinful, you're wicked, and you deserve God's wrath. That's the bad news. But I have some hope. There's a reason we are gathered here on Resurrection Sunday. We have hope. You ought to keep reading in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You see the gospel is good news. That's what gospel means. Gospel is the good news that Christ came and he lived a life perfect. He was without sin. Hebrews chapter 4 said that he lived this life without sin. That's what he did. He died the death that we deserved. Remember what we said in Romans, the wages of sin is death? That's what we deserve. Christ took the death that we deserve. And then three days later, he was raised from the grave for our justification. So we have a right standing with the God of the universe. So when I stand in front of God, he does not see Caleb Gordon. He sees Jesus in Caleb Gordon. He doesn't see Caleb in his wickedness. He sees Jesus in Caleb that has forgiven him and had set him free from his sins. In Isaiah chapter 53, we have a picture of what God did for us. 
Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 says this. He, but he, this is talking about Jesus, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that wrought us peace. And by his wounds, we have been healed. You see, listen to me. I don't want you to feel like I'm just pointing. So I'm going to point it back at me here for a little bit. My sins, the, pa the pastor's sins are many. The pastor's sins are egregious and heavy. But because of Jesus' redemptive and power and blood being shed on Calvary's cross and his willingness to forgive me, I am free from my past. I am free from my sin. I, listen, I deserve everything that was in Isaiah chapter 53, and so do you. I deserve to be pierced for my transgressions, as in I deserve to have the nails run through my wrists and the crown of thorns shoved onto my head and the whippings and the, and the beatings that Christ endured. I deserve to be pierced for my transgressions. I deserve to be crushed for my iniquities or my sins. I deserve the chastisement. I deserve those things as the pastor of the church. I deserve God's wrath. But God. Amen. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You see, Christ's atoning blood that was shed on Calvary's cross brought me to a place where I am healed from my sinful condition. So the issue that is at hand is sin, but there is a remedy to the condition of sin. And it is Christ's redemptive work on Calvary's cross. And because of this, I am now in God's sight, a blameless child. I'm not a sinful creation. I am a blameless son of God. And I have peace with God because of Christ's work on the cross alone. I am saved by grace through faith alone, and that not of myself, lest any man should be able to boast. It is Christ who does the work. It is Christ who does the forgiving. You say, well, Caleb, that sounds great. I've actually never heard about this. How do I get access to this? Because I, maybe you're sitting here today and you're thinking, man, I, maybe I am sinful. Maybe I, am I saved? Am I a Christian? Well, Jesus tells us how to get access to this. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, he tells, as he kicks his ministry off, this is what he says. The time promised by God has come at last. He announced the kingdom of God is near. He's talking about himself. So repent of your sins and believe in the good news. What is the good news? The good news is that Christ came and he lived the perfect life. He died the death that you deserve, that you deserve. And he was raised three days later for your justification. He did that to save you. To seek it to see. Jesus came to seek it to save that which was lost. Which guess what? That means every one of us in the room at one point were lost and Christ came to find you. Christ came to rescue you. So what does it look like to repent? What's that word repent mean? Repent means to turn from, change your mind, change your direction, change your life. And you don't do that on your own. Scripture says that if you confess your sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness. So that's the first start. You open your mouth openly and say, Lord Jesus, I am sorry that I've sinned. Remember we just talked about sin? I'm sorry that I've lied. I'm sorry that I've stolen. I'm sorry that I didn't honor my mom and dad the way I should have. I'm sorry that I've had lustful thoughts. I'm sorry that I've been rageful and angry towards my brothers and sisters. I am sorry, Father, will you please forgive me? Here's the beauty of it. He will. Like, he will. Like, think about that. If you had a personal, if you created something, 
You made it, you put it together, and all of a sudden it just decides to throw the middle finger at you. It says, you know what? I don't like you anymore. You're horrible. And rather than squashing that creation, he loves that creation, and he comes and dies for that creation to buy it back, to save it from its sinful state. The good news is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of sins of those that would believe. Right. The good news is that Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. Those who, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 10, were enemies of God. Could you imagine that for just a moment? If you're out, if you're here this morning and you're just a nominal, just sort of kind of, I'm, I'm a Christian because, well, I live in America. I live in, a, in Kansas. You're still biblically an enemy of God. And there will come a day that you're going to stand before God alone and you're going to have to give an account. How do I know that? Because that's in Hebrews chapter 4. Yeah. God knows everything about you. And he still came after you anyways. Like, that's the cool thing, is that God knows everything about you, and he still came to seek and to save you. That he knows you're a mess, but he says, I can turn that mess into a miracle. The creator of the universe. Like, this is the wild thing. Would come to redeem a creation that committed treason against them. That's good news. Oh, what a mighty and gracious and merciful God we serve. And listen, we're living in a season of mercy right now. But that season of mercy will not last forever. And if you say, well, I'll take my chances, you're, you're riskier than I am. I'm just going to let my good outweigh my bad. You're going to be in trouble. Remember how I read in Romans chapter 6 verse 23, the wages of sin is death. That text keeps going. There's hope in that text. It says the wages of sin is death. Yes, that is a truth. But the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. But the only way that happens, the only way you get access to the forgiveness of Christ is you must repent of your sinfulness and you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you must pursue him. This isn't a twice a year thing where you just come in and do the check the box thing. That will not save you. That will not redeem you. A Christian is a transformed being. A Christian is a person that once lived and relished and loved its sin. Those are outside of Christ. A Christian is one who hates that sin. A Christian is one who maybe used to live that way, but he doesn't live that way anymore. The only way that you get access to a gracious God is if you repent of your sins. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Here's what happens. Some of you are all going to miss heaven by 18 inches. You got God here, but you don't got God here. He's not controlling he's not the lord of your life he's not the boss he's a guy that you think is really nice teacher up here james 2 19 says the demons in hell believe in god and they tremble but they ain't going to heaven yeah. just because you got head knowledge of christ doesn't mean you had a heart transformation by christ and in order to get to heaven you must have your heart transformed from a wicked, sinful, depraved human being to a, re a redeemed and forgiven human being. Right, listen, I don't get into heaven because I'm the pastor. Wow. There's a lot of pastors that are going to hell. Yeah. You want, oh, That sounds crazy. Are you serious? you really think that? I absolutely think that. I really do. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ is God and he deserves our worship. You, you see, so many in America, so many in America believe about God in their heads. We like to think about him at Christmas time. So we come and check in at church at Christmas. We all, baby Jesus, how cute. Because everybody loves a baby, right? But I don't know if you've read Revelation chapter 19 through 20. 
He's coming back and he's going to slaughter his enemies. And remember, those that are outside of Christ, Romans chapter 5, verse 10, that's the enemies of God. He will destroy humanity that is outside of his grace and abundance and mercy. But here's the, you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay outside of them. There is such a difference between having head knowledge of God and having a heart transformation by the Lord Jesus Christ. When human beings truly have an encounter with the triune God of the universe, there will be a lasting impact. And those that are in the room today know this illustration I'm about to use because I've been here long enough. You all know what I'm about to do. But there's enough guests in the room that probably haven't heard this. So let's give it a shot. What do you say? Okay. Chancey and I are out on 166. Chancey's a little bit down the way there. I'm up above. And Chancey can see it from the bottom. He's looking up and he can see. Caleb, behind you is a giant Mack truck. It's about to hit you. Get out of the road, you dummy. And what do I do? Chancy, stop being a guy that's trying to control my life, fella. Okay? Stop trying to control me. I can live my life any way I want to live my life. I can do anything I want to do. Stop being a hateful bigot. No, no, no. I'm trying to tell you. There is a truck coming down the road. I don't believe in trucks. I think you're an idiot. I'm trying to warn you, bro. The truck is going to run you over. I don't believe it. And all of a sudden, I turn around. Bam! The truck hits me. The reality is, the wrath of God is coming. We know that because the scripture tells us over and 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 over again. That is, that's coming. But so many say, oh, I don't believe that's coming. Oh, they've been saying that for years. I've been saying that for years. You think you're the first one to hear that? They've been saying that for generations. It ain't coming. Listen, one of these days you're going to die and you will stand before the God of the universe. Period. His name is Jesus. You will have to give an account. And if you stand there empty handed saying, oh, I don't have grace and mercy and the forgiveness of Christ. Guess what? You're Matthew chapter 7. You will be thrown into the everlasting fire. I'm trying to warn you. The Mack truck is almost here. And some of you are just like, ah, it's stupid. That's one, one group. The other group of you, fit, we're going to continue with the Mack truck illustration because I think it's great. <laughs> some of you think you are a Christian in the room because you're a Kansas or a Oklahoman. Awesome. Some of you Arkansas. Same, whoever. You think you're a Christian because you're an American. Let's imagine with me for just a moment. We're back to the Mack truck. This is a different one. Though. Imagine you guys have finished singing. I, the pastor hasn't shown up yet. And I run up the stairs in a heated, just sweat pouring off my head because I'm just hot. And I said, listen, church, I am so sorry for being late. I was out there on the highway, and I got run over by a Mack truck. I'm really sorry about being late. I'm here now, though. What would you say to me? Caleb, you're either a liar, or you don't know what a Mack truck is. Some of you say you have, been, you have had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, but your life does not look any different than it did beforehand. You're still sitting in the sins of your life and you're not con you're not convicted or concerned over your sins. You may get, I'm going to get wasted, bro. I and mean, then we brag about that junk on social media. Man, I was wasted. Tell your friends, man, we were so wasted last night. Oh, but I'm a Christian. Scripture says specifically, if you are drunk, you don't get into heaven. Scripture says if you're sexually immoral, you're not getting into heaven. Those are the, you read it, the script, I'm not, you say, Caleb, you, that's you, what you say. I'm just reading it verbatim. I'm just reading the word. The word says these are things that will not inherit eternal life. You will not get into heaven. Lying tongues, boastful, arrogant, prideful, abusive, sexually immoral. That's, that's the list. And I want to help you understand that because the judgment of God is looming on the horizon for all of us, that we're either in Christ or we're not. 
and the judgment of Christ, if you're outside of Christ, will you will have an experience of wrath. The judgment of Christ for those that are in Christ is a judgment to reward, not condemnation. How do I know that? Because Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, Therefore now there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. You'll either experience the everlasting life of God's grace and mercy in heaven, or you're going to experience the everlasting justice, judgment, and wrath of God in hell. And the only way you can live the everlasting life is that you must be born again. John chapter 3, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. A once born man cannot enter a twice born kingdom. Period. You must repent of your sins and you must trust Christ as Savior and Lord. That means he's boss. He's the king. I need you to understand. Jesus is king, and kings don't ask permission. Kings demand obedience. Period. No other options. So you say, Caleb, where does this, what are you trying to do here? I'm trying to help us understand healthy doctrine will, will transform our lives. Men and women in the pews are far more likely to be spiritually healthy when there is biblically-based teaching in the pulpit. And sadly, we've been witnessing a decades-long epidemic of subpar and unhealthy instructions in the pulpits, which is slowly starving people to death. I'll never forget, as my, my dad was pastor for almost 50 years, In our church in Oklahoma, people would come and they would say, Caleb, or Pastor Gordon, I've not heard teachings like this. And people that had been in church their entire lives were coming to realize that they weren't truly saved. And they were radically transformed. People that have been in church 40 and 50 and sometimes 60 years in church have been religious their entire life, but they were never ransomed by the King of glory. And we wonder why the church is finding it difficult to make an impact in our culture. We need pastors and leaders among us who are skilled, not in storytelling. And so many churches this morning, they are, they are terrified that, oh my gosh, people might not come back next week. I can almost guarantee you the bulk of you ain't coming back next week, so I'm not really concerned. Now, I want you to come back. I'd love for you to come back. But I know there's statistical likelihood. Y'all just checking your boxes. I'm here to feed the sheep, not entertain the goats. You can say that's not on, that's not, that's that's very unloving of you, Pastor. The most loving thing that I can do is warn you that God is going to judge you. That's the most loving thing I can do. And I can plead with you to please come to Christ. Please be born again. Please. We don't need skilled storytellers. We need Bible expositors. And that's what I'm trying to do is read you verse by verse. You want to be healthy in your spirit? Have healthy doctrines that re make you realize who you are in Christ and outside of Christ. In Christ, you're a king's kid who has authority and has the ability to crush the kingdom of darkness. Right. Outside of Christ, you will be crushed by the kingdom of darkness. And I'm pleading with you this morning on this Resurrection Sunday to give your life to Christ. Men who feed the sheep by imparting and teaching God's word are what we need. And that's what I'm pleading with you this morning. So here's what we're going to do this morning. In fact, I promised my brother-in-law last night on the phone. He said, Caleb, it's the biggest Sunday of the year. Don't you dare. Don't you dare not offer hope. Don't offer, don't, don't you dare not offer an opportunity for somebody to come to Christ tomorrow. I said, okay, I promise. Brian, I promise you. So Brian, if you're watching this, I promise you, brother, I made you a promise. We're going to take a few moments. I'm going to have Marjorie, Marjorie, if you'll come down here. And this is not going to be an extended emotional plea because I ain't an emotional plea guy. You've heard the bad news. I'm offering you good news. I'm offering you hope. I'm offering you a way out. 
His name is Jesus. You can find forgiveness of sins. You can find the hope and the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will save you. And I'm telling you, he will change your life. Can I get an amen from somebody in the room? He'll take the mess, and he'll turn it into a miracle. He'll take the wretch, and he'll turn it into the righteous. How do I know? Because you're looking at one. <laughs> you're looking at one right now that was an absolute wreck of a human being. And God took the wreck of a human being and got inside of him and totally transformed him. Now, does that mean I'm perfect? Ask my wife. It ain't true. I ain't perfect. But I'm forgiven. And I want to do what God wants me to do. So that's the difference, is that if you're not a Christian, you don't care that your sins are egregious. You don't care that you've sinned. Hey, everybody's a sinner. Big deal. No. As a Christian, you realize your sins are what killed the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're grieved over that. You want to, I want to move in a different direction. I want to, I want forgiveness. I want to turn from my sins and I want to turn to Christ. I want to go follow him, not my desires in this world. Because my desires in this world are passing away. 